A perfect sequel is a game that improves on essentially everything from the first game. It expands the story told in the first game, expands the gameplay, and ideally sees some refined graphical fidelity. Now, a perfect sequel is not a perfect game in my eyes. I don't think Infamous 2 is a perfect game. A really good game? Hell yeah. But not a perfect one. With that being said, it improves on almost everything from the first game, and that in my eyes makes it damn close to the perfect sequel. Now if you've not seen my video on Infamous 1, I highly recommend that you take a look at it, as it explains what I liked and didn't like, but I can very briefly give a recap here. Essentially, Infamous 1 was a really ambitious game, and as I argued in my video on it, too ambitious for its own good. The map seemed too large for the traversal abilities to keep up with, and it was even too large for the console to keep up with. Textures were often muddy, and pop-in was almost as numerous as the major frame rate drops which would often tank in to the single digits. Those same textures also just had a very muddy color scheme that made Empire City a bit of an eyesore at times. The story was pretty interesting and despite being relatively simple on the surface, had a ton of lore and kept me engaged despite it being a little cheesy, which again, I didn't mind. The traversal was a little too primitive for me though, and there were too many skyscrapers with little ways to scale them effectively. Mission design was fun in some cases, but often felt like padding in others. The morality system did a really good job of justifying both the good and evil options and your choices actually made a reasonable difference. The combat was a little too difficult for my taste, but not in a good way. I found too many enemies just flat out one-shotted you and these same enemies had the ability to go invisible. Boss fights were often just okay and they unfortunately were pretty unremarkable aside from the spectacle alone. Now I want to clarify something from my infamous one video. A lot of you thought that I didn't like the game and that's not entirely true. I have a lot of problems with Infamous 1, and while it may seem like they prevent me from enjoying myself, they don't, really. My biggest issue with the game was the difficulty, and so to remedy that, I just played on easy mode, which made it a lot more tolerable and I was very easily able to look past the different frame rate drops and muddy textures. I like the game a lot, but I feel like it's a game that works better in my memory. Fortunately, Infamous 2 in my eyes has a better story, better characters, a better world, better gameplay, and better graphical fidelity than its ancestor and I'm going to try and explain why I feel that way throughout this video. Before we go any further though, I have to clarify that I will be spoiling everything from both Infamous 1 and 2. These games are pretty old, so if you haven't played them by now, you probably won't ever. If you have been interested but haven't had the chance to snag a copy of the game and you still want to hear my thoughts, then proceed with caution. Finally, this video is just my opinion and I'm not here to objectively judge this game's quality. I'm simply telling you guys what I like and don't like. I know that much like my Infamous 1 video, some of you may disagree with what I'm saying and I'm totally open to talking about it in the comments. I was happy to see that a lot of you on the first Infamous video were pretty respectful and I hope we can do that again here. So now that all of that is out of the way, let's get down to it. As I stated earlier, just about everything in the first Infamous, both good and bad, was improved on or expanded upon here in Infamous 2. Infamous 1 stars Cole McGrath, a courier that ends up gaining the power to control electricity after a package he is delivering, which is a radioactive bomb called the Ray Sphere, detonates. Cole was not the only one who had powers activated by the Ray Sphere and his goal is to stop those who are using their powers for evil. He gains a reputation as a hero and after defeating a mysterious figure named Kessler, he prepares for an abominable foe named the Beast. Now there is also an evil route, but the good ending is canon so I'll stick with that. For a more in-depth summary and analysis, please refer to my Infamous 1 video. Infamous 2 takes place a few months after the events of Infamous 1, where our protagonist Cole McGrath is preparing for the arrival of the Beast. He's working with a contact named Quo, and as they are preparing, the Beast arrives. He absolutely thrashes Cole, and he has to flee to the other side of the country to power up in the city of New Marais, and that's all you need to know for now. First things first, I have to talk about the new voice actor for Cole. Cole's voice in the first game was really gruff. Too much so for me, and I found that he sounded too depressed and dark. I'm doing what I can, Zeke. No one needs to throw me a parade. I know, man, I know! Here, he sounds a lot better, and it will immediately make a good impression on you. First boat out of town? Chick's got some connections. This is gonna be a short-term visit, man. We're just gonna get in, I'm gonna get some new powers, and then we're gonna come right back. Come on, man, you deserve to relax! All the iconic voices for people like Zeke return, and the voice actors do a great job with their roles ranging from Quo to Nyx to this game's side villain, Bertrand. The music in the first game, for myself at least, was not very memorable, however, the music this time around, especially the ending credits theme, really fits the game. I won't touch on this too much since music is so subjective, but I enjoyed the soundtrack here a lot and felt it was better than the first. The sounds of Cole frying the militia and the sounds of the different enemies all sound great and it seems there's a lot more clarity in the game's audio, which I appreciated. As far as the looks of the game, it looks way better than the original. 
The opening title screen is somehow just as good as the first games, and the graphical fidelity here is through the roof. Sure, the resolution is still pretty low, but I found myself experiencing far less pop-in, and the designs of characters like Cole feel so much better. The environments still keep their muddy, run-down aesthetic from the first game, however they have some more color mixed in with them, as neon signs and bright green grass clutter the streets to create a city that looks lived in. And it's also just nice to look at. The city itself is designed quite well too, but we'll talk about that later. Character models here look really good, and we don't see the same goofy facial animations from the first game. Characters like Bertrand and the Beast have incredible designs that are easily recognizable, and I'd argue that characters like Zeke have near iconic designs. The lightning effects in the other superpowers look awesome here, and honestly, I think the footage speaks for itself. As for the performance, I can say that it runs better than Infamous 1, but it doesn't run that much better. Don't get me wrong, it is far more optimized than the first game, and I don't believe I ever got into a situation where the frame rate hit the single digits, but the game consistently drops below 30 FPS. Fortunately, much like the first game, I don't think it really impacted my experience. It was never so bad that it would hinder my ability to play, but it was at least noticeable. Regardless, it runs much better than the first game, which is surprising because the effects here are truly on another level, and the map feels so much denser. When it comes to the cutscenes, they still have their comic style to them, and they look so good. I won't expand on it too much because they are near identical to the first game's cutscenes, and I already covered those in my first Infamous video, but regardless, they look good here too. As far as the in-game cutscenes, they also look fantastic. The visuals here really bring this game to new life, and I feel like I gush over it for ages. But ultimately, the art style change may put some people off, and I understand that this just might not be your cup of tea. But let me tell you, it is mine. Even the fine details presented in the story as a whole were done so well in my eyes. Take Zeke, for example. At the beginning of the game, he looks as handsome as ever, but as the game goes on, he contracts a deadly virus going around New Marais, and it isn't revealed until one of the final missions. Despite this, you can actually see Zeke's complexion get worse over time, and near the end of the game, his face looks dead white. What I find funny is that on my evil playthrough, Cole actually looked worse than Zeke. His actions and his powers have corrupted him so much that he looks more sick and twisted than someone with a deadly virus. I thought this was a nice detail, and it's not the only one like this over the course of the game. When looking at the way the race fear virus has affected the town, it's so cool that they nailed the realism and the details of people being sick on the ground and nobody wearing a fucking mask! Animations this time around look a lot more heroic. Cole strikes these poses when in the air and when landing on a ground that resemble a pose that Spider-Man would strike, and it really gives you this idea that Cole is a superhuman. His movements and actions are far more exaggerated and it made a lot of sense. When compared to the first game, his actions were a little more rigid and stiff, likely due to his powers being new and him having to try especially hard to control them. Here, however, he moves with a lot more fluidity and he seems more comfortable with his powers. I'm not saying the developers intended this, but I think it's a happy accident that shows us a slight evolution in Cole's experience with his powers. He still puts a ton of force into his attacks though, especially the rockets, which see him slugging what looks like a cannonball from his hand and the powers outside of electricity look amazing too. Ice appears gracefully and shatters enemies with a great amount of style, and the other power, Napalm, looks incredible from the Firebird strike that essentially lets you fly for only a brief period, to the Ash and Tar-like grenades you throw. I find it interesting when comparing this game's style to the style of the Arkham series. While both games are way different, their comic book origins are quite similar, and the first entry in the series for both games had a dark and grittier aesthetic, however, I find it cool how Arkham went the route of making the game darker and more realistic, while Infamous 2 doubles down on the comic book aesthetic. Since I've already talked about the city so much and how good it looks, I think we should talk about the design of the city and why I like it a lot more than Empire City. To recap, the main things I didn't really like about Empire City were as follows. I felt like the buildings were too tall and it often took too long to scale those buildings, making traversal inefficient and not very fun. I felt like the map was not very traversal friendly as it was difficult to grind from one power line to another and clearing large gaps between buildings could take a fair bit. I also know that this is an issue with the traversal in the first game as well as the city's design, but finally, I felt that the different islands didn't do enough to separate themselves both aesthetically and through its design. They all just had large buildings made of stone or brick, and there were little in the way of landmarks barring Ground Zero. New Marais off the bat is much shorter than Empire City. I'm not totally sure if it's bigger than Empire City, but it's definitely more horizontal. Empire City was a very vertical environment. Every building was tall and the gaps between buildings were often large, or at least too large to be cleared in a single bound. New Marais, on the other hand, has a ton of shorter buildings with smaller gaps in between them, which take advantage of Cole's more horizontal movement. To elaborate further, when you look at Cole's powers, most of them accelerate him along the X-axis. They propel him forwards, not upwards. 
The thrusters help him gain more distance, grinding rails gives him a way to move around quickly along the x-axis, and none of these powers propel him upwards very much. Even one of the new powers in the game, the Firebird Strike, sees you clearing a large distance in mere seconds, and that's the closest we're going to get to direct flight in this game. That doesn't mean you couldn't gain height if you wanted to, but you weren't going to get to a rooftop without using some of your free running abilities. Now, along with making the city tailored for this kind of movement, the game also gives you some vertical movement options. Most notably is the Ice Launch, which propels you upward, and is a really useful tool for traversal. The thrusters even get an upgrade here too, making traversal even better. By far the best addition to the game's traversal are these vertical poles that are on the sides of buildings. They act as grind rails and can be used to very quickly scale the side of a building. It is in my eyes such an ingenious idea as it allows you to very quickly scale a building when chasing a target or when you need to get some high ground for an advantage in a fight. It allows the game to have higher buildings while also removing the pace breaking climbing of the first game. The final industrial area that you enter in the game has these massive structures that you can scale efficiently with this new vertical grind pole, and it gives you both the higher buildings without sacrificing your momentum. This isn't the only time the game has its cake and eats it too, but we'll discuss that later. As for the different districts this time around, I enjoyed almost all of them. The first district you get to after working your way through the swamps in the second mission is the Vilkachin. It sees a lot of medium sized buildings with small to large gaps in between them, perfect for trying out new traversal abilities and familiarizing yourself with the landscape as the roofs here are flat and there are easy places to take cover behind. I really appreciated that halfway through this district you unlock the upgraded thrusters, which allow you to go farther with your thrusters. A small change, but a very welcome one. I appreciated that the first few missions reminded me of the problems I had with Infamous 1's traversal, which saw me barely missing jumps simply because my thrusters were not powerful enough, and I like that the game near immediately remedied that problem. The second district you enter, Ascension Parish, sees some more complicated structures like cemeteries and homes with slanted roofs. There are not as many places and objects to take cover behind here, so you have to get a little crafty, such as using the peak of a house's roof to shield yourself from enemy fire. The locale here wasn't my favorite, but I think it works perfectly fine. The next district you enter is Flood Town. Now I have to admit, I can't stand this place. Okay, I'm exaggerating a little bit, it's not that bad, as I just found it a little annoying in all honesty. As the name would make you believe, the entire town is flooded, and if you're at all familiar with this series or electricity, then you know that coal and water don't mix very well, and if the water is deep enough, it'll lead to an instant game over. Fortunately, the water in Flood Town is not deep enough to kill you most of the time, but your mobility is hindered in the water and your health will be decimated with each second spent submerged. I actually like this from a design perspective a lot. It's constant platforming from one submerged house to the next, and considering that you enter this district directly after gaining a new traversal ability, be that the Ice Launch or the Firebird Strike, it gives you the perfect obstacle course of sorts to test out and master your expanded movement options. The reason why I'm not a fan of it is because the missions here were on the boring and monotonous side. And there isn't a ton of color here. I'm not saying that you need a colorful map for it to be aesthetically pleasing. Just look at the Arkham games, which typically have a color palette of black, gray, and more black, yet look really good. Here, it feels as though it leans towards the ugly side, and it doesn't help that the missions here don't always take advantage of the level's design or even your powers. The final district you enter is the Gasworks, and it's one of my favorites. This is where the game reintroduces the verticality of the first game, but also equips you with the proper tools to use it to your advantage. This district is filled with tall structures with grind poles going along them, allowing you to get from the ground to 100 feet in the sky in mere seconds. Considering that the enemies here are the most advanced at this point, having the ability to freely move among the map is even more appreciated, especially when you unlock the final upgrade to Cole's abilities, the Lightning Tether, and it's really a game changer. And while I will talk about it more later in this video, I have to commend the fact that this environment was really made to take advantage of all of your abilities. You'll have to mix rail grinding and thrusters with your tether to get around, and I appreciate when an environment immediately requires the use of a new ability. The environments here are all so awesome, and even though Flood Town wasn't my particular cup of tea, I can certainly appreciate what it goes for. Environments seem to be built around your abilities to the same extent that your abilities are built around the environment, and it led me to enjoying this city a lot more than Empire City. Overall, the city had a wider color palette, a more diverse aesthetic, different aspects that affect gameplay in a significant way, yet they still felt like they were all part of a connected world. I think New Marais is easily an improvement over Empire City in every way, and it even has a subway. That's gotta be one of the strangest product placements in a game, and it stands out like a sore thumb, but I kinda love it. 
Since we've already dipped our toes into it, we should talk about the traversal. Cole here on foot moves similarly to the way he did in Infamous 1, though I swear his running speed has been increased a bit because he really looks like he's hauling ass. On top of that, due to the game's wonderful animations, he looks like he's putting all of his force behind him when he's on the grind rails, and the distance you go once you hit the end of that wire is huge. When you get the decision to swap powers with either Quo or Nyx, you get either the Firebird Strike or the Ice Launch. The Ice Launch gives you a sizable jump, and mixed with the thrusters, it can give some considerable distance. I appreciated that with the Ice Launch, it's the perfect height for you to get to the wires around the city, meaning you'll no longer have to climb up the pole, adding a new layer of efficiency and fun. The Firebird Strike, on the other hand, feels like a primitive smoke dash as it sends you straight forward, making clearing even the largest of gaps a breeze. The only issue I have with the Firebird Strike is that your momentum is immediately stunted upon exiting the strike, since it's a strike. I really wish you could gain some forward momentum from it, especially since in my experience I have yet to see too many people use this ability in combat, as most from what I have seen have used it for traversal purposes. The tether on the other hand, as I mentioned, is a complete game changer and allows you to tether and pull yourself towards anything within the vicinity. I absolutely love this ability and my only real complaint is that we don't get a ton of time to use it in the main story. It seems like the game ends right after you get it, but I guess it is useful for side quests and cleanup in the post game. The tether is the closest we're going to get to a Sucker Punch developed Spider-Man game as you can cancel a tether midway through and throw it another in the air, leading to a lot of moments where you just don't touch the ground for minutes at a time. On top of the mechanics of the game is the ability to swap powers semi on the fly. All of your traversal abilities are mapped to R2 and you must swap between your Ice Launch, the Firebird Strike, and the Lightning Tether. I would have liked if we could map different powers to different buttons. I could potentially map the Firebird Strike to Triangle and the Ice Launch to X, with the Tether to R2, allowing me to use them in unison rather than having to pull up the menu to swap between them. It may seem like a nitpick, but an extra level of freedom here would have been really nice. Also for the last point of discussion, I'd like to ask why is the Firebird Strike not called the Phoenix Strike? It sounds so much cooler than Firebird. So overall, the traversal in my eyes was a lot more fun than the first game and was improved on in every way. Now of course this game's traversal is obviously better because it literally has the same powers as the first game, but with just more to use and with more powerful thrusters, so that's no surprise, but I truly feel that the world's design here is what made the traversal so fun. This is so much better when compared to Infamous 1 as it felt like the level design was always working against you. Another aspect in which the first game felt like the environment was working against you was in the combat. In the first game, as I mentioned, the environment was very flat, and I think that this was by design, so I don't want to hate on it too much. There were always places to take cover behind, but it made you play the game like a cover shooter. A lot of Cole's abilities felt like they were being pulled in both directions, as he had abilities that would stun or knock down an enemy, such as a grenade or the shockwave, which can be really useful when trying to get an enemy out of cover. On the other hand, though, if you yourself are not behind cover, you'll be killed lightning fast. They gave you all of these powers that let you fire an electric bazooka from your hand, and yet made you frail as glass. Here, as I've already mentioned with your increased vertical movement, you are able to avoid enemies way better, and getting to the high ground when necessary won't leave you exposed for a long enough time to die five times over. On top of that, a lot of the later game areas give you multiple different things to take cover behind, not just a basic stump or lump of sandbags. I won't bother going over the powers from the first game because I already covered them in depth in that first video, so I'll instead cover the new powers here, as there are quite a few. For starters, I'll talk about the brand new powers and then discuss the variants later. The Ice Launch and Firebird Strikes have already been commented on, but what I didn't mention too much is that the Firebird Strike can also be used in combat, though I didn't find a ton of use for it. I assume this is why it costs more than the Ice Launch to perform, as the Ice Launch only costs one bar of electricity, while the Firebird Strike costs two. When choosing to obtain Quo's powers, you also get access to the Ice Shield, which functions the same as the first game. And if you choose Nyx, you get to summon these little demon things called Spikers, and they're truly awesome. You also have access to some new finishing moves, the first of which being the Ionic Vortex. This summons a huge tornado down on the path in front of you and decimates everything in front of it. It was really convenient when there were a ton of enemies in a line in front of you and not every enemy drops an Ionic Charge, so I never found myself with the ability to really spam this. The Ionic Storm does return, but not until the late game and it functions the same as the first game. The Ionic Drain is a variant of these Ionic abilities that allows you to bio-leech everyone in the immediate vicinity in one shot. And look at how many enemies you can take out with this! This shit's crazy! 
On Quo Zen, you get the Ionic Freeze, which essentially freezes and incapacitates everyone in a 90 degree angle in front of you. Pretty cool, but ultimately pretty tame in comparison to the other abilities, and I think it might be the least useful. If you have a bunch of enemies in front of you and you need to take them out quickly, you are better off just using the Tornado. Also returning from the first game is the ability to restrain enemies, heal injured civilians, and bio-leech them to consume their life force and heal yourself. It's nice for some quick karma points, but other than that, I didn't use them too often. So those are all of the new powers, and it may seem like there isn't much here, but that's because a lot of the quote-unquote new powers come from the variants assigned to your basic abilities. For example, you have your basic lightning bolt called the Alpha Bolt, which is a little pea shooter, but you can unlock a new variant called the Pincer Bolt, which sends out three bolts at a much slower fire rate that arc and hit your target. The advantages of using this is that because basic enemies on normal difficulty take three headshots to go down, you can knock somebody in literally one shot. The downside is that there is a slower fire rate, so if you're not hitting your shots, then you'll be in some trouble. There's also the Magnum Bolt, which sees you firing a single bolt, which allows you to hit enemies hard, but again, there is a slow fire rate. The difference between this and the pincer is that the pincer arcs, meaning that it can land some better shots on enemies behind cover. There's also the rapid fire bolt, which turns the electric pistol you had on your hand to a submachine gun, and it's perfect for spraying and praying. I'd like to draw your attention to another change made to your basic bolt in this game, and that is that it now uses electricity. In the first game, you could fire this bad boy till the cows come home and it wouldn't drain your power, but here, not so much. It doesn't use that much power, but it uses enough that I found myself looking for a power source more often, and it prevented me from draining a power source and spamming my rockets, as I didn't want to leave myself with no power, so I was a little more precise with how and when I used my power. When it comes to the shockwave, there are a few new variants, such as the Nightmare Blast, which stuns your enemies for a while, and there's the Shatter Blast, which freezes enemies and functions similarly to the Graviton Blast, which sends enemies back like normal, but they're suspended in the air for longer. Finally, there's the Punch Blast, which is the same as the Basic Blast, but with a tighter spread, and it does more damage. When it comes to the grenades, you have the Basic Grenade, and eventually there's the Sticky Grenade, which is self-explanatory. And then there's the Double Grenade, which is much the same. The big ones are the Napalm Grenade, which explode on impact, like the Double Grenade, but it does the most damage. The Cryogenic Grenade freezes weaker enemies on impact and does some good damage too. Finally, the Cluster Grenades is just the Double Grenade but better in my eyes, and last up is the Rockets, which have some variants like the Tripwire Rockets, which are again self-explanatory, and the Redirect Rockets, which function almost the same as in the first game. Variants also include the Sticky Rocket along with the Ice and Napalm Rockets, but they all serve the same function, acting as some good heavy damage for bosses and decent AoE damage for groups. Finally, the most quote-unquote out there ability I found was the Kinesis, which sees you picking up any old object and tossing it at your enemies. I found this move to be useful, and I think it's used in some pretty fun ways within the campaign. Fun thing I found about this Kinesis ability, though. When standing on a car or any wide object, Cole will stand on top of it and raise it off the ground. If you let go of R2 and press it again, the object will rise again before going back to its default height. If you time this right, though, and consistently let go and press R2 with a rhythm of sorts, you can start raising it infinitely. And, well, it's definitely a lot of fun. The reason I wanted to bring up these different variants was because there is a really neat system tied to unlocking them. Remember the stunts from the first game? They would give you rewards for using your powers in different ways, those rewards being either trophies or experience, and for that reason I never bothered to experiment with them too much. In Infamous 2, they lock these power variants behind these stunts, and most of the stunts you have to perform are really useful. So not only are you being encouraged to use your powers in a more efficient and stylish manner, such as sending enemies flying off of a building with a blast, but you were also being rewarded with a new type of blast. I also appreciated that these challenges were never too hard, but did require a fair amount of effort, or at least most of them did. I mentioned this once already, but I felt the way that you switch powers could have used some refinement. I like that you can switch powers on the fly and all, but it still brings up a menu that completely pauses the game. I would have preferred something akin to a weapon wheel of sorts that just slows down the game to make it less jarring, or better yet, map a shortcut to the controller that allows you to cycle powers freely without pausing at all. For example, take up on the D-pad. You can have a shortcut where if you press up on the D-pad and the button corresponding to the power at the same time, you'll swap the same way you would in the menu, but it happens in real time. 
I feel that this could give players the ability to express themselves so much more with the power system and to further this freedom they could add an advanced power mapping tool in the settings that lets you map each power to a different button or a combination of buttons. Imagine the freedom this could allow you. You could have a build that focuses on bolts and grenades, and you can mix cryogenic grenades with napalm grenades, or mix an ice launch with a firebird strike, and then finish it off with a lightning tether. Of course, I know I say this a lot, but I'm not a game designer, so I don't know if this would be crazy difficult to implement in future games, and take what I say with a grain of salt. I'm just spitballing here. So overall, I feel like the combat here is so much better than the first game simply due to the extended arsenal. Every ability from the first game has made a return, barring the Gigawatt Blades. Now I'm not sure if you guys know about this, but in the first Infamous game there was this melee weapon called the Gigawatt Blades, which replaced your basic lame melee attacks. This however had to be downloaded from the PlayStation Store, and the PlayStation Store hates me and wouldn't let me do it, so I didn't really have any footage of it. Instead, just imagine some really cool electric blades coming from Cole's hands, and they do insane damage but at the cost of a lot of your power. In Infamous 2, we get the amp, and oh man is this thing so much cooler than the Gigawatt Blades. First off, it's more balanced as it uses no power, yet does decent damage. On top of how awesome it looks, you can make it look even better by performing a finisher move. These look flashy and take out an enemy in no time, however it gets better. At about the halfway point in the story, you unlock ultra finishers, which are even flashier and my god these things are fun. It's great too because the melee is now an actual viable strategy. So back to what I was saying, literally every ability from the first game is here, and some, so there's no question that it's an improvement because if you don't like the new abilities, you don't have to use them. I personally wasn't a huge fan of the ice grenades and other cryogenic abilities, so I just stuck with the classics. And now that we've covered the gameplay side of things, we should mention how these gameplay mechanics are applied. Mission and level design here was really good in my eyes, with a lot of mix-ups and a few boss fights mixed in for good measure. The opening level serves as a good example as it gets you right into the action. And as the player, you are given tips and tutorials for how to play the game while also feeling how insanely powerful Cole is. Having been beaten so bad, you go from firing these mortars from your hands to these little electric lemons, and wanting to have that again is your initial drive to play the game more. You just want to get back to that point where you can unleash thunderstorms at will. The following mission in the swamp introduces you to your traversal abilities along with introducing karma, which I'll have to cover later. The opening moments of the game were really a ton of fun and they did a fantastic job of introducing the many characters in this story, and the way things unfold happen at a great pace. When heading to Dr. Wolf's lab at the beginning of the game, you can get an idea of how grinding on wires works, and chaining them together. Tracking down Bertrand for the first time and chasing his limo allows you to refine that skill, and it's particularly easy and fun in this mission. Directly after, you end up taking down a helicopter and it's also over the top, but without breaking the suspension of disbelief. Once you finish up everything in the starting areas, you can move into Flood Town. Now Flood Town is by far the most boring part of the game, and I will try to explain why. So let's start with the first mission which sees you powering up Flood Town. These missions are fine, but the environment here works best when you're constantly moving, however, in this mission you're forced to power up the generators which essentially lock you in place. On top of that, a lot of enemies are in the water for this mission. Now this mission takes place right after you swap powers with Nyx and Quo, but using anything other than electricity here will leave you at a disadvantage, since a lot of the enemies here are in the water, meaning one basic bolt will fry everyone. I would have enjoyed an environment that encouraged us to make use of our new powers, and if we are going to be placed in this environment where movement is to be capitalized when in combat, we shouldn't be in a mission that basically locks us in place. The next mission you have to complete here is the Dunbar Beam, which sees you using a spotlight to take out these huge waves of monsters. Now this would be a lot of fun if the game didn't make you go to what feels like three different locations on ten different occasions. Furthering this is how you take down these enemies, you literally just aim at them. In most turret sections you would at least have to aim and fire, but here it's literally just looking at them. It melts health bars and it can take out a large group of these guys, but we do it so much here that it got boring and I dreaded this mission on each playthrough. I guess it's not that bad, but when we're given this titan of a character to play as, it feels ridiculous that we're using machines that any old Joe could use. It would be cool if when there are a ton of enemies around, the beam would break down and then Cole would have to come in and finish off all the remaining enemies. We get a slight taste of this at the end of the mission when returning to your safe house, but ultimately everything leading up to that point had me pretty disengaged. One of the missions after this sees you putting a cap on some holes that are spouting fire. This task takes ages, and it doesn't really move the plot along at all. I just found myself getting bored here because a lot of the missions in Floodtown didn't advance the plot. 
Now there are missions and cutscenes in Flood Town that do advance the plot, but for example with the Dunbar machine, the advancement that happens in the plot is finding out that LaRoche has a blast core and didn't tell Zeke about it. This happens at the end of the mission and it is caused by a cryogenic soldier saving the group from a swarm of enemies and doing so only to get the blast core. Could we not have just gotten a call from Zeke before the mission starts explaining that the base is under attack, skipping the whole Dunbar beam thing? Now, I want to clarify again that these missions are not atrocious at all, I just wasn't rocking with it. To be fair though, for every low in the game there are about 5 high moments and these are really the only missions that annoyed me. There was also a really good variety in the missions, such as a mission which sees you powering up a bus and protecting it as you lead it to a plantation, blowing it sky high. Missions like the final encounter with the beast are so much fun and both the evil and heroic playthroughs are beyond satisfying. The mission design here is actually quite similar to the first game which had some really cool levels, but I enjoy the missions here because the environments complement the gameplay so much more. I also cannot make a video on this game without talking about the coolest concept and by far one of the best missions in the entire franchise. In one of the final missions, Cole is tasked with taking down an insane amount of enemies and these guys are all top tier, doing a huge amount of damage and taking a huge amount too. The catch is, there's a thunderstorm that night, meaning you can charge yourself up from the sky, which like, wow, what an awesome concept and you really feel like a powerhouse here, just spamming rockets and drawing energy from the sky, man it was just so well done. Further missions taking place in the gas works are really fun due to the added verticality and they make a really good use of your abilities while introducing new powers and enemies. The enemies here are pretty diverse and fun to combat. The militia are your run of the mill thugs akin to the reapers in the first game. Some wield riot shields and some have machine guns, pretty basic but I have no quarrels with them. The corrupt are these swamp monsters that have some variety. They are melee based and as such are perfect targets for your new amp, however some of them function very similarly to the suicide bombers from Infamous 1, and they are equally as annoying. The cryogenic soldiers are the most unique enemy in the game and they serve as a really fun set of foes. They use guns and conduit powers to deal some damage to you with some using ice shields and some using… <sighs> shotguns. These shotgun soldiers can move incredibly fast and they get right up in your face and just blast you. Where these guys improve over the shotgun foes in the original game is that they just can't go invisible and here there is a solid delay between when they aim their shotgun and when they fire, so you have ample time to distance yourself. The enemies are not locked to one district necessarily, though as the game goes on the cryogenic soldiers will become more present as they are the most difficult enemies to fight. What I have yet to mention about these enemy groups are the handful of mini bosses tied to them. The militia don't have any mini bosses unless you count the minigun enemies, but I don't think I would because they don't have a health bar. The corrupted have many different mini bosses and even full on bosses. The first of which is the ravager. These guys can burrow under the ground and can do some pretty hefty damage. On top of that, much like a lot of the mini bosses, their rough exterior leaves them unfazed by regular electric attacks. You'll have to make use of some of your more explosive abilities such as the grenades, rockets, blasts, or kinesis to take these guys down. They were pretty fun and challenging enough to fight and they even get a slight upgrade later in the game where they can spawn these tiny monsters called spikers that can nibble away at your health. The devourer is next up and this guy can only be damaged through his weak point in his mouth. He contains a lot of abilities like spitting his toxic bile at you and he can blow you back with a roar. On top of that he can send out his tongue to grab you and try to eat you. <laughs> This type of mini boss is a lot of fun for me and what I like about the two mini bosses here is that they reflect Bertrand's moveset. Hitting weak points, the projectiles, the ability to spawn enemies, the tongues that pull people in are all present in Bertrand's fight to a larger degree. I really appreciate boss fights that incorporate skills you've already learned over the course of the game so I found Bertrand and his mini boss counterparts to be really well done here. The cryogenic mini bosses are also pretty fun as the first, the Crusher, has some pretty intense attacks, such as spawning these chunks of ice in the ground, picking them up, and then tossing them at you. They also have some melee based attacks and can move quite quickly. They're eventually followed up by the Titans who are easily the bulkiest and strongest mini bosses in the game as they can fire an intense ice beam at you along with other projectiles that come out at a pretty quick speed. They are damaged through normal means like rockets and grenades but can have their limbs blown off. When their health is low enough you can expose their weak point through a quick time event and with it can start doing some more damage. I like the rate at which these mini bosses were introduced and used after their introduction. They spiced up gameplay without becoming too saturated. The only real bad instance I had with a mini boss is one where a titan is spawned on a boat. 
The Titan has the ability to send you flying away from them if you get too close. On the boat, with all the enemies surrounding you and all the explosions that could hit you in such a tight space, the odds of Cole getting too close to the Titan is pretty high, and if that Titan were to blast you away, there's a high chance that you'll end up in the water, giving you an instant game over. Other than that, these were pretty fun. Then there are also the actual boss fights in the game which are really good barring a few, but we'll get to those as they become relevant. First off, I may as well talk about the fight against Bertrand. Both occasions since they function quite similarly to one another. The first time you see him you're being chased through the city with him hot on your trail and you take him down by taking out his weak points. This fight is short and it's picked up on and expanded upon in his second fight near the end of the game, which is much harder as there are a lot more complexity to his moves and he has further moves at his disposal. As I mentioned before, they are all derivative of the smaller mini-bosses, and we spend a lot of the fight leading Bertrand into explosives and causing him to tear the very island that he owns apart. Shooting the missiles that get lodged in his skin while hanging from a helicopter was a really awesome set piece and overall the fight was fine. Not too mechanically deep, but cool enough. Next up is Nyx who uses the RFI against you when you first encounter her. She is taken down quite easily through melee or rockets, though her second phase on top of the cathedral is a lot harder due to her intense moveset. She uses a lot of abilities against you that you have, such as the Firebird Strike, and it felt really well balanced as she is damaged like a normal enemy. I wish I had more to say about it, but I don't. It was just a good time. Quo, on the other hand, is a different story, and that's because her fight was less than 10 seconds. I did not experience her fight at all, because when she spawned, I just blasted her with the rapid fire bolt, and it was over before I knew it. I should also mention that my recordings were done in one session for each playthrough, and when I finished Quo, I just laughed it off, and my monkey brain did not at any point until the autosave had taken over, thought, huh, maybe I have to critique this boss fight and I should probably reload a save. Finally, we have the fight against the beast. This boss fight only takes place in the good playthrough, unfortunately, and it's quite similar to your first encounter in the first game. The difference is, you're now a little bit stronger and your goal isn't even to take the guy down, it's just to stall him. I'm actually quite torn on this fight if I'm being honest. I like it a lot, but we've seen the beast take down half of the east coast and even survived a nuke, so we know that unless Cole is packing a serious nuke-sized lightning bolt in his back pocket, there isn't much we can do. But I would have enjoyed something a little more than just wailing on him until the health bar hits zero. This was an issue I had with the first Infamous as well, and while some of the fights here are better, mechanically speaking this fight feels inferior and quite underwhelming when compared to Bertrand. We don't use our abilities in different ways to take him down, at least not in his first stage. On the other hand though, it felt so good to just unleash all of Cole's powers in this climactic David vs Goliath battle. Furthering this is when the beast returns and Cole is wielding the RFI. Since it is fully charged, we literally have unlimited power and it felt so good to just one last time go balls to the wall. Again. On one hand, it's literally just pumping a big man full of electricity, but the set piece and the spectacle of it alone was enough for me to not really care. Now at this point we should probably discuss the elephant in the room regarding these bosses. Being that there are only 4 boss fights in the game, a maximum of 3 per playthrough. That being Bertrand, Quo, Nyx, and the Beast. I bring this up now because you may notice that aside from the ending, the only boss fight is against Bertrand. I didn't mind this because there was a good balance of mini bosses mixed in and plenty of amazing set pieces to keep the game interesting. While yes, the evil ending sees you only fighting Nyx, it also allows you to tear ass through New Marais with the beast acting as a little devil on his shoulder and it just doesn't get better than that gameplay wise. So when comparing it to the first game, the boss fights are fine. They're not much of an improvement mechanically, I mean it's not like the bar was set very high with the first Infamous as it was, but I at least felt like the pacing of the boss fights were well done. Here I just wanted another boss fight in between the Bertrand fights. I think it would have kept the pace up, though I'm not sure if boss fights are Sucker Punch's forte. I mean even in Infamous Second Son, the boss fights are essentially the same as they are here. So maybe it's okay for them to rely on the intense set pieces to carry the fights rather than the mechanical depth. Because of that, I can't say for sure which game has better boss fights, though I can at least say that I prefer Infamous 2 since it had a larger scale which the first game didn't really have. I should also mention that there are some side quests in the game that can be done to clear an enemy's presence in a part of the map. They function near identically to the first game and were just as mediocre, and that's why I didn't talk about them at all in my Infamous 1 video. I just had nothing to say on them, and here it's basically the same thing. I can at least praise both games for not making the side quests necessary, and you'll have no struggles with feeling underleveled if you do decide to skip them. 
Finally, before we get into the story, we should take a look at the karma system and how it's handled. When it comes to gameplay, it is quite similar in that if you're good, you need to be a little more mindful of your surroundings, and if you are evil, you can just go balls to the wall all the time. If you're good, your stature will be more rigid and heroic, and if you're evil, not only will your clothes and skin tone reflect that, but your stance will also be hilariously slouched. The first decision you come across is when entering New Marais. You can charge up the generator to lower a bridge, charge it up to get across into the village filled with militia. However, if you want to make life a little bit easier, you can overcharge the generator, causing it to explode. This will wipe out the entire militia presence, but also the women and children. Both choices are justified if you ask me. Of course, one is clearly the wrong option, but it reminded me of the tar decision from the first game, where if you take the blast of tar, you'll have your powers limited, but if you get someone else to do it, then you can cruise through with no problems. Whose health is more important, yours or theirs? It's especially nice seeing these kinds of decisions when we compare it to the decisions made in Infamous Second Son, where the options are literally redeem or corrupt the youth. <laughs> The more stilted choices from the first game here are absent and it makes the choices feel a little more gameplay driven. What I do miss from the first game is the moments in which the game takes an active look into Cole's mind. He'll stop for a moment and actively weigh the pros and cons of each decision. It just went a long way for making both choices justifiable. This only happens at the last decision. The final decision is also the only official morality based decision that takes place outside of gameplay. What I don't really enjoy necessarily is the restrictive nature of this decision. It's posed as an actual decision, however, if you were on an evil playthrough, you would have to spend your time doing kind actions to switch your morality in order to make the heroic decision. Now, on one hand, I understand to an extent why they did this, because if you were able to make a decision regardless of your karmic alignment, it could defeat the purpose of having the decisions lead up to that point in the story. It wouldn't make sense for Cole throughout the entire story to disregard normal humans and yet in the final moments, sacrifice his life to essentially eliminate the evolutionary jump to save those who he deemed worthless pawns up to that point. Though at the same time, they didn't have to give you the choice. It would have been really cool in my eyes if they took away your choice and if Cole's decision was predetermined based on your actions up to that point. It would be especially neat considering that all major decisions in the game are left up to the player. The descriptions of the options talk about fulfilling your destiny, and if the decision was made for you, it could allow the game to comment more on destiny and morality, but it ultimately doesn't. At least, not as much as it could. Most of the actual choices in the game are made in gameplay like the first game. Healing citizens, restraining enemies, bio-leeching, stealing blast shards, and shooting street performers. The major story decisions, however, are made in the split missions. You're given two missions in front of you, and whichever you choose, the other will be locked out. What makes this in my eyes not as good as the first game is that Cole does not really give his thoughts on any of this. When nearing one of the missions, either Quo or Nyx will call you and encourage you to choose the other mission. These never did much to convince me, and that's because a lot of the decisions here, not all of them, were pretty black and white. Some on the other hand are presented in a moral grey area, but are still treated as a black and white decision. At the halfway point in the game, you'll be given the option to swap powers with either Quo or Nyx. No matter what you choose, the machine that transfers the powers is destroyed, so nobody gets Cole's powers. So you essentially have the choice to get Ice or Napalm. The issue is, Quo is a heroic playthrough exclusive, meaning that if you are evil and choose to swap to Quo, you'll be swapped from evil to heroic karma. The thing that bothered me about this decision is it is the only decision in the game that seemed to have no clear distinction between what is right and wrong. It shouldn't make a difference who you swap powers with, since either option results in Cole gaining a new moveset and the other receiving nothing. So why is it then that this decision is the only one not color coded? I know that I have mentioned in my Second Son review that I felt the decision should not be so black and white, but why is morality tied to this at all? I can only assume it is because Nyx encourages Cole to indulge in his evil desires and because Quo encourages him to do the opposite, but ultimately making this decision tied to your karma just threw me off. What's worse is that some of Nyx's and Quo's powers are tied to your karma. So if you pick Quo's powers and then decide to swap to an evil playthrough, you just won't have either of their powers. I think the major difference with the karma in this game compared to the first game is that it drastically changes the missions. In the first Infamous, you were doing the same missions regardless of karma, however the missions will be approached differently. For the example of the oil tankers, you could tank the damage that would come from manually shutting down the tank, or override it, injuring the people, but saving yourself. 
In Infamous 2, the overarching goal might be the same, but the way you approach that goal is entirely different. For example, when trying to break into a militarized fort to get the power transfer device, you have two options. Quo suggests we empower the resistance to entice them to work with us. Or you can stage a militia attack with Nyx, where she's in disguise as one of the militia mowing down LaRoche's men, allowing a perfect opportunity for Cole to swoop in and convince them that he is the only protection that they have. These missions are wildly different from each other, but what makes them a little underwhelming is the outcome and consequences of this choice and many others. I bring up this specific choice because in my eyes, it falls apart when you look at it a little more. Correct me if I'm wrong, but nobody in their right mind would want to take Nyx's route. In Quo's plan, she is essentially empowering the resistance that is going to help us storm the fort. In Nyx's plan, we are literally killing and weakening the forces that we want help from. On top of wanting her allies to be sick and unarmed when storming the fort, she also claims that if the resistance is too strong, then they won't depend on the conduits for help. But why would they refuse the conduits help? Cole is already pretty friendly with LaRoche, and it's not like the healthy and heavily armed militia ever stood a chance as it is. Is the mission at least fun? Yeah. But logically, it makes no sense, and this is unfortunately a running theme that persists throughout the game, and something that we have seen gets worse in Second Son. Take the choice that is presented to you in Flood Town. Cole and the gang are trying to figure out the next way to take down Bertrand. Nyx tells them that Bertrand is actually creating the monsters that have invaded New Marais. Quo makes a very good suggestion. She thinks that they should find evidence and put them on blast in front of the entire city, turning them against this political figure. Now Nyx suggests that they find some of the creatures and work to get them on their side, and states that they could cause a ton of chaos together. But how does this further the plot at all? And how does this help them achieve their goal of taking Bertrand down? It's not like they can build their own monster army to combat his seemingly unlimited supply, so again, nobody in their right mind would pick Nyx's options because it's just a waste of time. On top of that, it doesn't even serve her karmic role because training these monsters to fight for you isn't a bad thing. Now, there is an issue with the karma system here and the way it affects the story in that it really doesn't. I'm not asking for the game to have a million different branching paths based on your decisions, but for the sake of replay value, having only a handful of missions exclusive to each playthrough isn't entirely enough for me. I also felt like my actions did not result in any real change. To explain what I mean in a more visual manner, I want you to take a look at this line here. This is the story. Now, in a typical story, if you were to choose to, say, expose Bertrand, it would branch out and you would be led down the line to where the city is now on your side, and they could help you in the next fight against Bertrand. If you choose to raise an army, that would branch out as well. And that army would help you in the fight, and it could cause even other ramifications, but I don't want my expectations to seem too high. On the line, it would split and then continue. The way it actually works here is that the line splits for a moment and then immediately goes back to its neutral state, in which your choices have had no impact. In reality, if you raise an army, it makes no impact. And if you expose Bertrand to the city, it also makes no impact. These branching paths are just dropped as if they never happened. Now, is this better than the first game? On one hand, yeah, because the choices didn't make much of an impact on the story there as well, and it didn't result in any new missions. But on the other hand, both options when you were presented with a choice in the first game were justifiable. So I do enjoy the first game's karma more, but ultimately I can see why you would like this game's karma system more as well. I think this is overall the only point in which the game could be considered inferior to the first game. So now that we have covered the karma and have touched on some of the choices in the story, I'd like to analyze the story as a whole whilst giving a summary. Cole picks up his training at Empire City with Lucy Quo, a government contact attempting to help him prepare for the arrival of the Beast. The Beast shows up and absolutely destroys Empire City and Cole. Cole and the gang narrowly escape and flee to New Marais where Cole meets Dr. Wolf. Wolf has had his blast cores stolen. Blast cores are what is needed for Cole to acquire new abilities and charge the RFI. The RFI, also known as the ray field inhibitor, can essentially work as an anti-ray sphere and takes powers away from any conduits. On top of that, it can completely cure the plague that has infected a majority of the world. A plague spawned from the radiation poisoning that was left over from the blast in Empire City. We track down the blast cores and try to deal with Numeray's new dictator, Joseph Bertrand, who is using his militia to turn a once rowdy and party-driven city into a large-scale prison. Along the way, Dr. Wolf is killed and Quo is captured. 
When we find her, we see that she has been given cryogenic powers that allow her to control ice, though it is not explained how these powers were given to her within the story itself. It's touched on, I believe, in audio logs, but it doesn't really matter. Regardless, her powers have been copied onto soldiers, similar to how the DUP had Augustine's concrete abilities. We also meet with a conduit named Nyx, who was given powers after Bertrand used another ray sphere in the swamps of Numeray, explaining her powers and Bertrand's. We work to collect blast shards, and we eventually befriend the leader of the resistance against the militia, La Roche, and with his help we take down Bertrand and eventually get powerful enough to charge the RFI. I'm going to try and analyze this upcoming decision here more than any of the others because it actually makes a difference in the story since it changes what ending you get. Before this decision, Cole meets up with John, your contact from the first game who gets consumed by the Ray Sphere. He explains that the plague that is wiping out humanity will not stop and that he can actually save people from that plague. John has the power to identify who has the plague and who has the conduit gene. John can activate that gene and cure them, but those that are not lucky enough to have such a gene will die. Considering that around 1 in 16 people are conduits, this option certainly gets your hands dirty. When charging the RFI, Nyx, Quo, and Cole all felt that they were dying, and this information was hidden from them by Wolf. Quo, realizing that she will have to sacrifice her life, is now more inclined to join John. And Nyx wants to kill the beast no matter what, only to get revenge on John for killing her swamp creatures that she stole from Bertrand. Now, I like this choice a lot because both sides are justifiable. On one hand, the beast is everything that Kessler worked towards. He spent decades crafting a master plan just so he could create coal and turn him into the only thing capable of stopping the beast. It's the only way to save humanity, but at the cost of any conduits whether they are activated or not. Otherwise, John will destroy the entire world and humanity will have to start almost all over again. On the other hand, John's method, as Quo states, works. It is a surefire way to guarantee that humanity survives this plague, as activated conduits are immune to it. It's an evolutionary jump that some would say is necessary. As we know from what Nyx has told us, Empire City was not the only location with a ray sphere. Are humans going to continue to create these ray spheres and these explosions? What if we stop the virus, kill all conduits, and then another psycho like Bertrand comes along and creates a new ray sphere, setting it off and then leaving humanity with the same plague and the same dilemma? What if in this hypothetical next pandemic, we don't have both the RFI or the beast to give us a surefire way out of it? The choice is boiled down to who should be saved, the humans or the conduits. I like that this choice is a moral grey area and that the typical enforcers of heroism and villainy are swapped here. Nyx wants you to take down John, and Quo wants you to join him, and their motivations are really good. Quo has always been someone who wants to do the right thing, but now that her life is on the line, she just wants to survive and she's scared. Nyx, on the other hand, is flat out just looking for revenge. She doesn't care what is right or wrong, she only cares about killing John. I enjoy that they form their stances not based on the game's designated side of the morality coin that is given to them, but because of their own personality traits. Even then, they still somewhat enforce the different sides of the way this series portrays morality. Based on the decision to get revenge on Hank and Infamous Second Son, it's clear that Sucker Punch sees revenge as an evil action. So Nyx falls into that side of karma, and yet it influences her to make what this game determines as the right decision. Doing the right thing for the wrong reasons. I think that's what I mostly don't like about this choice though. The fact that it poses this really interesting dilemma and yet it makes the decision for you. The game color codes the decision so there's no denying which decision is right and which one is wrong. On top of that, as I mentioned before, the decision is made for you as if you want to swap to what the game defines as the evil decision, you'll be set out on the evil path. It completely defeated the purpose of having a choice and it made this really well presented dilemma feel underwhelming. If you choose to help John, you have to rampage through Numeray, having your powers amplified by the beast, and you have to fight Nyx along the way, and the game really does a great job of making you feel like a powerhouse. You also have to kill Nyx and eventually kill Zeke. The way the game forces you to take your time with killing Zeke is just completely wrenching at the heartstrings, and despite Zeke betraying you in the first game, and despite your relationship between Zeke being so on the rocks throughout the game, you really felt bad about it. After everyone who could pose a physical or emotional threat is out of the way, John tells you that he is simply too tired to keep going. He then transfers his powers into Cole, and Cole essentially leads the charge going across the world to finish John's work. If you choose to charge the RFI, then you need to go fix it up, since it was damaged by Zeke earlier. 
Quo ends up shutting down the power across New Marais, and so we have to get it turned back on to proceed. We have a fight with Quo, and because it lasted 8 seconds, we very quickly move on to charging the RFI at the cathedral. But as we're planning to leave, Nyx sacrifices herself to stun the beast, and it gives us enough time to fully charge the RFI. Before hitting the button though, we get one last fight with John, and it's no competition. When we have the RFI powering us up, and John's powers which further amplify our own, we absolutely annihilate him. Once he's stunned, we're about to press the button, but Quo shows up. Repenting for the wrong choice, she admits that she was just scared to die, and Cole shares this sentiment. Regardless, he pushes the button, and it's a happy ever after. All the humans are cured, and all the conduits are dead. Cole is hailed as a hero, but Zeke takes him out to sea for his burial. We see a bolt of lightning at the very end that supposedly hints at Cole still being alive, but I don't want to get into any speculation. I think both the endings here are pretty satisfying, and I appreciated that the most important plot points are wrapped up in both endings. I feel like it was a satisfying conclusion if we ignore the karma system at play, and I feel it did a better job than Infamous 1. For example, when the looming threat of the beast is present throughout the entire game, every time you obtain a blast core, the game tells you how far away the beast is, and when you press pause, you can also see a map of how far the beast is, and the cities he has destroyed. There's even a point where you can clearly see the beast just over the horizon of Numeray. The game reinforces how much of a threat it is on multiple occasions, including a mission where you launch a literal nuke at it. And it survives! We then have to struggle to get ourselves and Zeke out of the area, and despite me hilariously dropping a light on him, it was just one of the awesome set pieces here. The only issue I have with the story is how it is ultimately hindered by the karma. Some tasks such as exposing Bertrand end up meaning nothing to the overall plot because the story insists on remaining as neutral as possible. Cole responds the same in cutscenes regardless of his karmic alignment, and I'm not asking for wildly different branching paths here, but at least some more noticeable differences would be nice. Fortunately, the characters don't suffer from this issue aside from Cole to an extent, and I'd like to now transition into the characters in the game. Cole doesn't talk much here. He's strong and stoic, but he's still hurting from the events of the first Infamous, as shown when Zeke asks about Trish. Actually, man, reminds me of taking care of you after the blasting Empire. But, uh, me and Trish were worried sick for nothing. Trish should have been worried. He got her killed. He still carries that guilt, and Trisha's untimely death is not the only thing that haunts Cole here. His relationship with Zeke is as unstable as ever, and Cole doesn't seem to trust him 100%, and even blames him to an extent for everything that happened, and honestly, I don't blame him. Zeke betrayed you in the first game and was ultimately pretty selfish. He's still selfish here to an extent, as he seems to near expect Cole to sacrifice himself to charge the RFI, but we can get into that later. I'll die if you don't. So will millions of others. I like that Cole seems more confident in his powers as he now has a lot more control over it, and he's a little arrogant in some cases. And I appreciate the way the game presents this, because it allows Cole to feel like his own character with personality traits outside of his morality. Even when he's heroic and makes the right decisions, he's still a little self-indulgent, as shown when he decides to, instead of immediately charging the RFI, enjoys his powers one more time before it's all over. He's all too eager to consume the first blast core to the point where he nearly blows off Dr. Wolf. Together we will defeat the beast! Oh, enough of the pep talk, Wolf. Let's do this. He snaps under stressful situations, and I just appreciate when heroes are not made out to be this biblical prophet who is a paragon through and through. Zeke is much the same as the first game with his classic one-liners and lackadaisical approach to everything. Easy quote. We get there, we're gonna be about the three B's. That's beer, mm -hmm. boobs, and mechanical bolts. Gentlemen, I don't think that you understand the scope of what is going on here. The duality between Cole and Zeke is pretty interesting, and seeing Zeke essentially on his best behavior is a constant reminder that he still feels bad for screwing over Cole back in Empire City. Listen to the sadness in his voice when Cole brings up that event. You join the militia? Oh, it's more like a Zeke Dunbar. Double agent. You get it? I'm a spy. For our side. Right. Oh, ye of little faith. Well, my faith's been shaken before, Zeke. <laughs> thought that was water under the bridge. Come on, man. It's clear that Zeke has, to an extent, learned from the events of Empire City 2. He is no longer power hungry, and his detrimental jealousy of Cole has turned into a great deal of respect. 
Remember when Zeke tried to play the role of hero in the first game and got captured by Alden's trash men? Well now he's not sneaking into bases on his own. Sure, he's finding ways to help, such as joining the militia in order to gain intel, but in the game he ends up playing the sidekick role rather than trying to be the hero. Though he does have his moments of heroism. Such as when he saves Cole from Bertrand, who has him locked in a cage, meaning he can't use his powers. I think it's pretty poetic that in the first game Cole has to save Zeke from a cage, and in this game Zeke is saving Cole from a cage. This is what causes Cole to realize that Zeke really is there for him and that he needs to stop treating him so poorly. They're best friends and the game hammers it home so well. Take the cutscene where they just sit down, crack open a beer, and just relax together. You ever had one of those friends, you know, the one that you're so close to that sometimes you'll just do things together without really talking at all? You're both just chilling out, enjoying each other's company? Well, if you're wondering what that's like, I'd say this is a very accurate representation. Even in the evil ending when you have to kill Zeke, it's brutally clear that neither of them want to do it. But their goals force them against each other, and for Zeke, it's a fight he can't win. Nyx is an interesting character due to her backstory and style, but I found myself not liking her more than anything. This is due to how she feels like she doesn't have a ton to her character outside of pushing the plot along. Her reasonings for wanting to do the things she does are so unproductive to the goal that I'm left wondering what the point of her was aside from being a counter to Quo. Quo, on the other hand, is a little more fleshed out, though it seems her story is skipped over a bit here. What I mean is that she's clearly a good person, but when she gets her powers, she ends up hurting Cole, and Quo says that she just doesn't know how to control her powers and that she's scared, and I liked seeing that. I wanted to see more of how someone like her would react in a situation like that, but instead, literally right after this cutscene, she starts kicking ass and her learning to control her powers is never brought up again. Past this point until the final decision, she is ultimately filling the same role as Nyx in that they both act as the angel and devil on Cole's shoulders. Bertrand was a neat villain, though there isn't much surrounding him in the story. There is a plot with him attempting to create these super soldiers made for war, but this is not touched on aside from the mission in which it's introduced, since we take him down pretty soon after. I would have enjoyed seeing more about this, but I can also see why they didn't bother focusing on it too much. John was interesting too, since as explained earlier, his method of curing the plague is a justifiable one. I also appreciated that John's seemingly untied loose end from the first game is tied up here. LaRoche was just okay. He didn't do much, so I don't really have a ton to say on him. He's just a perv, which I guess is his biggest personality trait. But yeah, not much to go on here. I like the story here generally speaking due to the excellent voice acting and due to how climactic the ending was. I think it certainly has some more missed opportunities than the first game story, but I also think that's because it's so much bigger than the first game. I think as far as the sequel goes, it does a good job of tying up any loose ends from the first game and giving a satisfying conclusion for the pre-existing characters. However, some of the newer characters felt a little underdeveloped, which parallel some of my issues with the first game story. Instead of Trish being underdeveloped, we have Nyx who felt underdeveloped. I think that is where I'm torn most here. I feel that this story works as a sequel seeing as it does tie up those loose ends, but at the same time it creates a new list of problems and untied loose ends. That's why at the beginning of this video I explained that Infamous 2 is almost a perfect sequel, but not a perfect game. It did so much to refine the experience of the first Infamous and it added so much to it that it makes it a must play for any fan of the series. There are some issues here but it was ultimately a really fun time and in my eyes a satisfying conclusion to Cole's story. The game looks much nicer and runs much better too, even if it still falls below the 30 FPS mark on a frequent basis. The powers from the first game all return in some form here and it gets even better when you factor in two new elements to control and a huge variety of powers at your disposal. The traversal was much tighter this time around and the settings seemed to have been especially designed to make use of your movement. This led to the traversal and overall gameplay being a lot more fun for me, since I was able to move freely without having to scale a skyscraper for 20 seconds. The boss fights are still pretty primitive here, but ultimately it was a little more complex than the first game's fights, and the spectacle of it was turned up to 11. The karma system here was really why I say this is almost a perfect sequel, because I think the first game did it better. The different decisions here didn't often have an impact on the story, and they were typically very black and white. Hell, some of them were even decided for you, and not in a good way like how Infamous 1 handled the Trish decision. Fortunately, the well-written story and fun characters made up for it even if it's still left some to be desired. Infamous 2 was a fun time and a game that I can definitely see myself going back to. I think in some cases it's probably the best Infamous game in the series. I still think my favorite is Infamous Second Son, but if someone were to ask me which one is the best, I think this is a no-brainer. 
With that being said, I've looked at all three of the mainline Infamous games and I would really love to see a sequel to Delson's Story or just another Infamous game in general. I won't say that this series is done for me since I have yet to take a look at Infamous Festival of Blood, but that'll be for another video. As for now, I'm hopeful for the future of the series because I truly believe it has a bright future ahead of it and there's still more to explore in the world and gameplay of Infamous. If the series does end here, then I gotta be honest, it'll feel like an incomplete story and it's gonna suck. Because I love this series, and I'm sure gonna miss it. Hello everyone, thank you for making it to the end of this video. I just wanted to say thank you so much for supporting the channel. I hope you enjoyed the video. Let me know what you want to see next down below. Subscribe if you haven't liked the video. Share it on Twitter because it helps me a lot. The algorithm loves when you do all that stuff. Um, I want to say thank you to the gold tier patrons. Bossian22, Christopher Moreno, Francis Pop, Perdica, and Pyrite. For the silver tier, I want to say thank you to Dr. Nannard, Jacob Douglas, and Chiefy. And for the bronze tier, I want to say thank you to Denzel Ritesh and Nathan Figs. Really appreciate your guys' support. It's really awesome. So thank you. I also want to say that I think my next video will probably be on Batman Arkham Origins Blackgate. And then I'll probably make a video on Honey Pop, the first one. And then maybe one on Honey Pop 2, because that comes out a few days from now. In fact, I think it'll be coming out the same day that this releases. Or a day before this releases. I don't know. Anyways, um, go check out my Twitter if you want at that boy aqua you can subscribe to this channel if you're not already you can also hit the like button comment and share it on twitter i uh it's basically all i have to say it's midterm season so i'm really tired and i apologize that my voice sounds like ass uh, i've been editing this video for like so long now <laughs> like i've been editing it straight for the last like eight or nine hours at this point and that's only to finish up the last like 15 minutes of the video take care of yourselves i know at least in uh, british columbia for me um, you know, we're not doing too great with COVID. And so, uh, you know, thankfully I'm not a monkey. So I, I stay home and I, uh, wear my mask and whatnot. And I hope you guys are doing that too. Keeping yourselves and others safe. Um, uh, you know, I hope you're, hope you're taking care of yourselves. Hope you're all staying safe and healthy. And I will, uh, see you in the next video. I love you guys. Take care.